Hi, in this video I am going to go through the week nine poll for fall 2024. Um, this first question has you characterize different types of RNA. So for instance, the difference between immature mRNA, which is kind of like all the steps leading up to it eventually being translated by the ribosome um, and starting from transcription of the DNA. So um, early on in this process, the mRNA molecule still has the introns uh, still inside of it, at least within eukaryotic systems where we have introns. Um, so an immature mRNA will still contain intron. A mature mRNA, the introns will generally have been removed. It does turn out to be a bit of a probabilistic process and not always going to be removed, which kind of gives some flexibility to the DNA code, which is, you know, interesting um, and evolutionary based. Anyways, so the uh, brings amino acids to ribosomes, that is just our straight up definition of transfer RNA. It is a RNA uh, molecule that is for attached, I don't really remember how, um, to amino acids and then the ribosome uh, like connects them into the growing polypeptide chain uh, and that's the process of translation. Is polyadenylated? Um, most of you probably figured this one out just through um, uh, you know, eliminating other options, um, but this is actually a really important process for uh, mature RNA for the process, for the like, the context of RNA sequencing because that polyadenylated tail gets added on near the end of the maturation process. And so it's one of the ways that we can actually try to target specific RNA molecules that are mature and really should be sequenced during a differential expression process. That way we can avoid some of the, the, the introns that an immature RNA molecule would contain and so that we can also avoid just other RNA molecules. Non-coding sequences often involved in RNA silencing and gene regulation. That's just our definition of microRNAs involved in gene silencing or RNA silencing. Uh, comprises 85% of all RNA in human cells by mass. Now, that's an approximate number. It really depends upon the cell, but that's ribosomal RNA, which if you remember, ribosomal RNA um, complexes are mixtures of proteins and RNA molecules that are what end up assembling our proteins from individual amino acids. Um, so that would be that one right there. Now, this next one, I don't know if I like this question still. I've been workshopping it for a bit. I think in the end, I just need to make up a pathway because using a real pathway just requires a lot of caveats and we'll have to work on that. But the idea here is that I'm just trying to make sure it is conveyed that the idea for a differentially expressed um, gene-based project is that as different genes are mutated and different situations are occurring, gene expression changes due to just effects on signal cascades, at least primarily, um, as well as things like transcription promoter regions and those regions getting modified themselves or um, modifications made to transcription regulation um, chemicals that get modified by mutations and no longer work the right way. Maybe they get just activated all the time, like they don't detach from the DNA molecule and they just keep sitting there promoting things. That is a possibility, especially for some of these like heritable um, mutations that uh, just more cause like a predisposition to cancer and things like that. So I, I, I'm more just trying to get you to think about like, all right, how do I place this into the context of these differential expression analysis projects that we're working on? And so I, I show you a signal cascade. Um, I believe IL-5 is actually like part of the cell membrane. I have to really go look that up to be sure, but it's clearly at the beginning of this signal cascade. And so like if I break IL-5, it's going to have huge ramification on everything downstream of it. So if any of these are transcription regulation um, 
like based and like they should be stimulating the production of something in some way breaking these receptors will break those downstream steps in fact it may just eliminate them entirely um, so yes uh, most likely given no other context about this pathway this is probably the most key step that you could break so don't want that one to break and then as you work your way down as you get kind of closer and closer to the final products the the, the likelihood that a mutation is going to cause gene expression changes is going to get smaller and smaller because there's just less kind of downstream processes. That's really what I was trying to get you to think from this and then I had to find a few different mutations. But I'd say like, you know, this one is, if I mutate this, it's gonna affect everything downstream. And so if any of these then express gene expression or if this is ex uh, affecting gene expression itself, that's all gonna be affected. But possibly, the rest of these are independent, and so it won't matter. Finally, I think I give you this one being um, uh, mutated. And so, yeah, if this one gets mutated, whatever is happening down here, which, which seems to be based upon some of this upstream, that is going to have, most likely, differential expression, as long as that mutating this triggers a differential expression. Um, and, and that's really what I was trying to get you to think of. So from the highest, anything that is going to affect that very high level, so like a, a frame shift mutation, going to be our absolute highest. Um, the rest of these are all RPS6. Um, so this kind of middle one is going to be our second highest. And now we need to just rank these three of the same thing. So a homozygous synonymous mutation um, in RPS6 is going to, if it's a protein coding gene, which I don't actually know personally, um, you could look up, but if it's a protein coding gene, should it have any effect because it is synonymous? Now there are some caveats that gene editing and things can still be based upon the RNA molecule, even if the eventual product is a protein, so that could be affected. So like it's not ruling anything out, but most likely, not going to affect anything. Um, a heterozygous frame shift mutation, pretty bad. That means that like if it's again protein coding, at least half of our transcripts aren't going to work or at least that's the most likely outcome from a heterozygous frame shift. Um, so that's going to effectively drop like the dosage of RPS6 within the cell by half um, and, and that can be a problem. However, a homozygous frame shift mutation, now all of a sudden that gene does not work at all, most likely. And so it has the, the mo of these three, it is the most likely to cause a problem. Now, just for the record, note I did say homozygous frame shift mutations for the rest of these. So that way you were kind of comparing, well, apples to apples ish, ap apples to pears maybe, I don't know. Um, that was the point. So. Hopefully that makes sense. Just clarify for me if not. Again, it's really more of a factor of I couldn't find like a really good pathway. So I think next time, this is my first time doing this question. I think next time I'll get an act, I'll just make up one. But there we are. All right. Um, given the following definitions, match the number to the correct description. All TCGA samples with open access count, mutation screening with any observed mutation in the gene CRAS, that is S1. So this is going to be any mutation in CRAS across most samples that we could possibly be interested in. I could scroll up, but I've got this memorized. S2 is all of, let me make that a little bit smaller. Um, oh, good job, Nolan, in the past. Now you can see that all. S2 is just all of our filter data. Um, so these are like pancreatic cancer cells. I think they were all male samples, all from like a particular region of the pancreas um, and all at a particular pathologic stage of the disease. So, you know, fairly well controlled, trying to be very comparable. This bottom circle, anything it overlaps, is a sample that contains a specific CRAS mutation. And I think it's worth noting that 
all of the samples contained within it, so 7, 171 plus 18 being 189, all 189 samples also overlap with S1. And if you think about it, well, this is a type of mutation in CRAS. This is all mutations in CRAS. So yeah, they, they always overlap for samples that contain this mutation. That means the 3,000 plus 14, so 3,014 samples have a mutation in CRAS, but they don't have this specific mutation. 18 of the samples that have mutations in CRAS, as well as samples that have any mutation in CRAS, specifically this one, 18 of them have um, overlap with this subset of the samples we're interested in. So there are 14, oh, sorry, 18 samples that are the pancreatic, head of the pancreas, all of that, but also have this mutation. There are 14 that have this mutation, uh, or sorry, have a mutation, but not the particular mutation, and overlap with our pancreatic data. So I don't want this one. I do want this one for um, comparison. So these are samples that do not have any mutations in um, CRAS and are from my pancreatic data. So if I'm trying to devise an experiment saying like, all right, well, what is kind of the effect of this mutation, that this middle section versus this outside edge, that's not gonna be our best comparison, like just for that experimental science. It's comparing slightly tweaked version of the gene to intact copy of the gene. That's a nice comparison, gives us something to really to investigate. So in the end, I'm just trying to match them. So I say samples from PAD subset that do not have mutation in CRAS. Um, so that's going to be overlapping with our S2 um, and not overlapping with S1 or consequently S3 because S3 is a type of mutation in CRAS. So that was that 14 at the top right. That's gonna be one of our comparison groups. Samples from the PAD subset that have a mutation in CRAS, but not the one being targeted. That was that 100, oh no, uh, that was also a 14. So they're in the PAD, they have a mutation, but it's not the one we're targeting. So it's yes one, yes two, not three. Samples from the PAD subset that have the mutation in CRAS, but do not have any mutation in CRAS. And if that sentence reads weird, it's because that's gonna be an impossible combination of properties. Like if you have a mutation in CRAS, then you have a mutation in CRAS. Samples that have a mutation in CRAS, but not the specific one, they're also not part of the filtered PAD subset. So they have this mutation, so they belong to this. They do not belong to this one. And I can't remember if the question said they have the the specific mutation or not. So if they do not have the specific mutation, it's 3000. If they do have it, it's the 171. So the question was, but not the specific mutation. So that would be 3000. Samples that have the targeted mutation and are part of the filtered PAD data set, that's actually the one we're most interested in to compare to our like intact copy, so that is that middle section, that 18. Samples that have the targeted mutation in CRAS, but do not have any mutation in CRAS. So that's obviously zero, because that's impossible. Samples that have the target mutation, but are not part of the pad filter, that is that 171 that we identified, and just to clarify, because that was probably the most common like distractor, I guess. Um, so 171 have the mutation we're interested in which means they also have any mutation. But the 171 differ from these 18 in that they don't belong to the subset of samples that have like the, the clinical data we're interested in. Um, so they could be from other projects, they could be from samples that got filtered out, so like female samples or samples from um, uh, pathology stages not at 2A or whatever I picked, things like that. And that's the end. Cool. So hopefully that helped. Um, I'll make a separate video going through the actual process of, of isolating those samples. So have a good day.